Hi there, Agile friends. Get ready for the World Tour of Agile at the Agile Online Summit 2023. You can join us from October 24th to 26th for a global showcase of cutting edge Agile practices and insights. Join us at agileonlinesummit.com. This year, we will be featuring some of the best work done around the world and world-class keynotes. You can check all of that at agileonlinesummit.com. But the best part is that your ticket is on us. That's right, it's free to attend and immerse yourself in the world of agile excellence. Don't miss out on this opportunity to level up of your skills and network with peers and industry experts. Mark your calendars and secure your spot at AOS 23 today by visiting agileonlinesummit.com. So get your free ticket or opt for the full digital pass that lets you keep all the conference videos forever and organize, why not, Agile learning sessions at work. You can get the full digital access at agileonlinesummit.com. I'll see you in the conference floor. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Team Tuesday. This week, we have with us Konstantin Ribel. Hey, Konstantin. Welcome back. Hi. Thank you. So we'll talk about teams because Tuesday is, of course, Team Tuesday here on the podcast. But uh, before we dive into that, do share with us, Konstantin, what's your favorite book, the book that most influenced you in your career as a Scrum Master? Um, can, can I share two, maybe? Yes, definitely. <laughs> I can just go okay. for it. Great. So uh, I would say there is like a, a professional level and a personal level. So on the personal level, I'm an I am an early riser, and uh, at some a morning point, person. I, a morning person, yes. And I asked myself, okay, um, how can I leverage that? So I looked on Amazon and um, I found a book. It's called The Miracle Morning, and uh, I I. Immediately bought it, read it, and uh, well, um, uh, the author uh, proposes to have a specific routine in the morning, and uh, I tried it out, and uh, this brought me really like clarity. It developed me on a personal level, helping me, and I I started in in the past decade. I would say I came to the conclusion that uh, your um, the professional development is limited by your personal development. And if you want to develop yourself further professionally, you need to tackle the personal stuff first. And um, yeah, that was the one really, a book that really helped me to get into, to leverage my um, my time in the morning. I really like that. And uh, I, I want to repeat that to reiterate the, that concept that uh, that professional development requires that you first do personal development. Yes. I think that's a, a brilliant way to put it. And uh, of course, now I can't wait to hear what your professional book was. So um, Extreme Programming explained the first edition, the first edition. Um, that is well, unexpected. I want to hear more about that. The book is rather thin. It's focused. But that's for it's sure. Really, it's really focused, but you need to read every sentence like three times because in every sentence, there is so much information condensed that um, it's just, it, for me, it was uh, mind-blowing how you can write in, a, in that way that it um, each sentence contains so much information. Um but why is it called extreme? Because, well, uh, I, uh, I, come to, uh, I come to the example of um, how they describe, how Kent, uh, Kent Beck describes um, code reviews, right? Code reviews are good. Yes, so then do them continuously, which leads us to pair working. And... Um, I really love the idea of peer working. If I could, I would do everything, literally everything, even writing emails as a pair. Um, but um, there are sometimes, it, sometimes it's not possible. Yeah, so, and every time I work with a team, I always have to think about, about the content in this book, always. 
Is there any, besides this, if code reviews work, do more of it and, you know, all, all the way to pair, pair working. Is there some other lesson that kind of stuck with you from that book? Um, at the moment, I don't, uh, I don't recall right any right now that pops up but because this is the one that, um, at least these days deserves the most attention. Yeah, because uh, you meet companies that say, yeah, 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 we, we have like open source policy in our company. Oh, all right. Uh, how does it work? Well, this team over here changes some code on a branch and then they do a pull request. And then um, four months later, someone reviews that. And uh, and then they, they get feedback that they need to change something. All oh, right. That is what you, mm -hmm. okay, no. That's they just not don't do that's that. not open source. <laughs> that's not open source. That's just pretended open source, right? <laughs> it's that's delayed feedback. Like that's delayed as as a big red and flashy word in sign of exactly. warning. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then you ask, okay, uh why? Why look, there is the person who will be reviewing your stuff. Yeah, that's right. Why don't you sit down at the very beginning before you start any changes and discuss with them what you are uh, about to change? And they will give you some context that will enable you and make it easier to change. Yeah, well, that's that's right. Okay, let's do it. Uh, and then you start working into that direction, reducing this feedback time, this feedback cycle to almost none. And then you end up with peer working. And it goes back to pair working indeed. And I exactly. really like this concept of uh, uh, shorten the feedback loop, shorten the time between action yeah. and feedback. Uh, and the idea that counterintuitively bringing the end to the beginning is how you shorten the feedback loop, right? Like what you said, yes. get yeah. feedback yeah. before you change the code so that when you change the code, you know what others are expecting rather than do something and four months later get the feedback that ah, this is not what we needed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, Konstantin, now we turn our attention to the teams and how sometimes they can become their own worst enemies. So tell us a story of a team, give us a little bit of context and then walk us through step by step how these small little behaviors over time developed and became a real problem for the team. Mm -hmm. mm. I would like to for the team to stay anonymous, um, if possible. That team, I've seen many teams, and I've seen this particular behavior also in many teams, but not at that extent. One team specifically, what they've been doing is uh, optimizing for individual work instead for teamwork. Tell us a little bit more. What does that so, look like? How does that look like? Yes. So um, they they attended the daily. Uh, the daily usually uh, looks like has the has the meaning or the tone of uh, I worked. Period. Status report to someone, uh, but definitely not their team members because they don't care what you worked on because they have their own little uh little tasks and uh so the team ends up you cannot i uh, know sorry i cannot even call that a team it's a group of people who pretend to be a team um and all the individuals individuals in that group work individually they don't work as a team they don't help each other out they work individually and uh that leads to a very um dysfunctional uh, state of the team um, and this particular team mm, I would say was really underperforming and um, unfortunately well unfortunately this this team was um, then as a result of that it was dissolved by the management what was it in in your mind like with the benefit of mm -hmm. hindsight what mm -hmm. was it in your mind that led the team to focus on that individual work that you were describing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one, one of the reasons is definitely 
uh, that the team was working remotely almost all the time. Rarely they came there, uh, they together uh, with like really for face to face conversations, face to face time, rarely. And that's one of the risks that we need to be uh, aware of. Now, yeah. it's not the remote work that causes it, but the remote work amplifies it, right? Because amplifies it's, it, yes. if, if you have a lot of stuff to do, especially teams that are very busy, if you have a lot of stuff to do, you want to focus mm. on doing it, right? And you don't yeah. want to be interrupted with conversations and meetings. And yeah. even very often, I'm sure many of our listeners have gone to a situation or have come to a situation where the team complains, oh, there's too many meetings. And when I hear that, I start start to think, but wait a minute, meetings is where we create shared understanding, where we make decisions together, where we work together on things that affect all of our work. When yeah. people complain about meetings, it's probably because they don't feel any belonging to that group of people, at least in the context of that meeting, right? You, you mentioned yeah. the daily meeting, but I mean, we were talking about pair programming at the beginning of the episode, right? If there's no ongoing pair work, like things that they design together, decisions they make together, yes, then that's yes. a huge anti-pattern. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, this goes back to teamwork. So it was really difficult, uh, actually impossible for that team to uh, to introduce pair working with them. Um, yeah. And what what would you like to have done differently? Like if you could, you know, go back in time and and redo that story all over again, what would you have tried? If there were the possibilities, I mean, then I would um, I would have tried to bring them together regularly. Mm, unfortunately, they were distributed like really across Europe, all the team members. So that would be in a lot of traveling, like flying for, for many teams. But of course, we can also try remote coming together, right? Like uh, uh, different approaches, like, for example, having a happy hour together, uh, having certain things that we make sure are shared. So, for example, in the planning, we could talk about, okay, so at least one of these stories needs to be owned by a pair. How do we make it happen, mm -hmm. right? Like yes. we, we can okay. create all of those opportunities within the context of remote work, even if it is, of course, a lot less effective than yeah. having face to face and, you know, going out for pizza or beer or, uh, you know, having an experience together as, as, as people in the physical world, right? Yeah, I would still go to the physical world. Um... Yes, let, let me give you an example from BMW. Uh, if you talk to BMW to BMW employees and uh, or you observe, sorry, you observe BMW employees getting together and talking to each other, you will hear you will hear a lot of stories, and those stories are mainly uh, about how their team went to. From so from Munich, we uh, BMW usually has like like three places in France and Sweden and in uh, Czech Republic to, uh, these days. They have um, test tracks, so uh, teams regularly go with cars to those test tracks and spend there like two weeks in a row. And they uh, they develop the software there on site. They flash the car. They drive with the car, they test it end to end completely in the car immediately. And the best stories are uh, uh, from those uh, test drives or test campaigns, they, they are actually called, uh, from those test campaigns where people together come there, they stay all together all the time. Like they're in one hotel, they have breakfast together, they have dinner together, they work all the time together. and since they are somewhere else away from their families, they even go sightseeing together. Yeah, the team becomes the family for those two weeks. Exactly, exactly. And uh, after that, well, and uh, after that, when they come back to the office and work in the office, there is something magical. Or even if they work remote, there is something magical. Suddenly, the interactions are much better. And um, 
there is less uh, less barriers between people and uh, voila stuff starts to work and yeah. i would I, I would like to have done that uh, to have had the opportunity with this team to do it like really regularly absolutely and and this reminds us that we are all teams in uh, we are all people in the end yes. and we need to relate to each other as yeah. individuals as well individuals yes. and interactions just like uh, the agile exactly. manifesto said thank you for exactly. sharing constantine you're welcome tuesday is team day here on the scrum master toolbox podcast but tomorrow we talk about something that goes beyond the work we do with the teams we will talk about how to lead change and what our guests have learned from leading and participating in change programs during their career. See you tomorrow. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring.